Okay, that's uh, starts uh, the third day of the Michael January. Um, it's still kind of early, I think. Uh, counting on some people to be added later. Uh, hopefully not too late. Um, today, the idea was to have people present works of art that they built with, that they created using the technology we talked about yesterday. <coughs> um, to see some applications of what's what goes on this time regularly. Um, so I'm happy to have uh, such a diverse group of people. Uh, we will have uh, Per Samuelson start with uh, the two joysticks. Um, I'm gonna I'll just announce everybody as we go, also because I don't have the list right in my head. So um, we will have Peter Sinclair with this group and uh, Tom and Voldemars uh, doing their project that they've been doing in time for, for the last well, for a little while ago. C.K. Barlow doing a live show on live setup in Lisa. Um, we've got Andreas uh, doing a demonstration. And I didn't forget anybody. It's always a danger if you do it. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I'll apologize later. Um, so, um, we will have a program until 1 ish. It will probably be more like 1 30 because probably a little bit later. Then we will have a lunch for the whole group. Um, that's going to be in the foyer. And after that, I was thinking about having a small round table just to talk about what we've seen today and maybe the respect to the technology we saw yesterday. So, I'll start talking and give the two joysticks on. Good morning, everybody. Nice to see you all of Everybody having a cup of coffee. <laughs> um, so I'm coming from Sweden, from a town called Jelle, to others from Stockholm. And I thought I would start to show where, where I come from and the place where I work. It's a place called IMGA, the Institute for Digital Arts, in the world of here. Uh, unfortunately, it's only in Swedish, but you can get an idea of what the place looks like if you click on the studio. You get an imagine of what size it is and what we're, we're doing. And the Institute for Digital Art means that we work with all kinds of arts, not just music, even if music is the focus of we have some video editing studios. We have a studio for digital arts, the sound studio, and the interactive studio. And interactive is the name when, when we work with sensors and joystick and stuff. Okay, I'm mostly a composer of electroacoustic music, also the sound engineer, and the instrument builder. I love to build instruments that not exist yet. But on my website, uh, here at samazon.se, you can see a couple of examples of them. That instrument builder, and we have this lovely English flag so you can understand them. <coughs> And we have a couple of examples. I like to work with uh, piezo elements, creating new instruments for triggering. This is a percussion instrument, kind of. And we also work with uh, more acoustic instruments, like this long tubes with microphones and speakers. And some electronics. You can read on there and get an idea. So, uh, this instrument I'm going to show you, which I'm calling Schlangsbocker, uh, maybe sound six in English. And the idea of this instrument, when I started doing this, since I'm a composer of electroacoustic music, uh, we are performing in, with this music in uh, loudspeaker orchestras, as you know. And one thing I thought of very, very early was that when performing electroacoustic music live, 
you do have control over the dynamics from the mixer board. You do have control over the specialization in the room. But you never have control over the duration of the piece. You can never do the timing between different parts. And I wanted to control that. And I started thinking how I should do that. And I started working with the Max MSP for a couple of years ago, not, not too long ago, uh, and thought I should build some kind of application for that. And I wanted to control the duration with something more physical, some kind of sensor, or in this case, joysticks, since I don't, didn't want to sit with a <coughs> second mouse or the computer to control it. And I started thinking, how, how should I be able to connect the sensors or some physical stuff to the computer? And since in Sweden, it's not very many people who work with this kind of stuff, so it's not that easy to find information about how to do that. So just like everybody else, I started surfing around. Uh, and of course, uh, ended up at Steinway website. And found Junction, and that was a major breakthrough for me. It was a very big deal to find an application that let me connect any kind of USB device uh, and translate it into me in a simple way. Everybody can understand it. Everybody can afford it. So that was a major breakthrough. So what's the first thing you do when you found Junction? You plug in your joystick and you see, wow, it's working. I think that's very good. What's the second thing you do? Okay, what am I doing with this one? It's possible to plug in another joystick. Yes, it is. <laughs> Great. <laughs> so then you start getting ideas very quickly and what you could, could do with this kind of tools. And it ended up that uh, it became more of an instrument to perform live than this tool to get control duration. Um, and I think I'm going to start to just play a little bit so you get to see what the, what the audience see and what the audience hear when I perform this thing on stage. Uh, because I have, have the laptop on the floor, so I have visual contact with it. It's about seven. You'll see why later. And the audience don't see what's on the screen. Uh, so I'll try to play some without that. But this really 
yes idea what was it all about. It's a kind of uh, granular synthesis, a uh, little bit longer in grains. So we have two samples I wrote to the program, which I prepared before the performance, in what kind of sounds I want. Uh, and then I had to start thinking, what are the joysticks going to do? We have these little squares where you can see the movement of joysticks. <coughs> and the first axis of, of the left joystick is the vertical, which controls where you are in the audio files. Which, which of course is from the basic idea of duration, but here I move more freely to the part where I want to play it. The second axis on the first joystick is pitch for the first sound file. And the same axis on this one is for pitch on the second one. kind of a simple application, but to me it, it has been very, very good musical qualities, which not is always the case when you start working with my class. You have a good idea and when you try it, oh, it's not that fun. But this is a very simple idea which has very good musical aspects to me. Uh, beside this granulation, granular synthesis, I could have some more sounds uh, <coughs> if I'm not interested, since I we have lots of buttons on the joystick nowadays. So nine of the buttons on top here, I have external sounds that I can play. try to learn a lot about it and uh, basically, basically this patch has an engine from Christopher Keynes. So the engine is basically a already made patch and then I have, have modified it and connected the joystick to it. There's a function
as we talked about yesterday and the day before, the difference before power users and people who want easy tools to use, to work with. I think there's, there's a really good point with, with the thought of, of easy tools to use as well, as, as it is important to have ability for the power user. Because I think it's a lot of time just as it was for me. To start working and, and don't really know what you can do. And say if, if I would like to start working with sensor, I, I don't start reading a big book like this. So, so the case when I found Junction and really had a very easy way to start working with things with devices, just right away and very affordable. It was a major breakthrough. And that, that made me start thinking. When I have started to work and actually do some stuff, then I get interested and really sit down and can read through this book. It really made um, interest. So I think it's, it's important to have both of these aspects as well. So maybe easy tools can make a couple of new power users.
thinking about next. Thank you. So what I think of next for this one is the first step, of course, uh, to construct my own grammars synthesis. Uh, I'm on my way, way to that. And uh, one problem I have is that uh, I have to have the laptop on the floor to actually see this. And the problem with that is that I look silly on stage. I stand like this all the time. Even if I need to stand like this, because they're ready. So I, I would like to have some other way to to get physical contact. And do you really have to watch the screen? Is it is necessary for performance? Yeah, yeah. To know where I am and but you can what it sounds like. Listen if you know the sample. And you can yeah, I can, do, but but it's kind of hard because you have two samples on the same time. Maybe you have a third sample that just tells you where you are, that you listen to by yourself. And yeah, that's that really smart. Yeah, that's what monitoring. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Bert Thomas of the Sonology Institute at that time made a little thing on, on the wrist, which it would give you a little pulse when you were at a certain location, so you could you would feel the grid. Yeah. <laughs> so, but, you know, because that was meant for a system where the sounds would change in the system. Because, of course, if the sound, the sounds are the same, you, you learn them. Yeah. Hard, that would be perfect just to get some cues. But yeah. just a little actuator ticking. Mm -hmm. I think Frank might know more about the. Project. I mean, there, there, there's also other projects where people put little motors in their shoes, which. Um, <laughs> kind of represents the waveform of the sample. So it's hidden in your shoe and you, you, you feel it and you can kind of navigate it. And wow. there's also a lot of research done in haptic feedback in yeah. uh, game, gaming mice that return the feedback of the sound file. Yeah, that um, would be great. Uh, things like that as well. So. That would make it the easy thing to check out by uh, using, using joysticks that have the possibility for the feedback, just a little engine. Yeah. That would make it an easy thing to prototype to begin with. Yeah, absolutely. See how that feels. And I don't need any extra gadgets as well. Can you get force feedback through these devices then from Max? Well, Junction doesn't fully support it yet. No. That's the problem. It does. We would like to. That would be nice to have a little bit. So you just started with telling that you wanted to control the length. Yeah, are you actually, are you actually, so this is your piece and you're slowly going through the piece? Or you just go all the way? <coughs> uh, the original idea was to just go through the piece. Yeah. But now I'm just shuffling around. Yeah. So I'm also working on an instrument that's going back to the original idea. Yeah. Just to move through the piece. Which is an um, iron tube this size with a wireless microphone. And I have a change the capsule to the piezo element so it can detect frequencies. So when you touch the tube with the rings, it triggers the playhead to move a little bit forward. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a little bit closer to the original idea. But uh, I think I instead I'm going to use that and put in the hands of dancers which can control the position of where they are in the piece. I think that would be interesting. Yeah. I was wondering, I'm, I'm a little tired, I guess. Let me see if I can speak clearly. I was wondering if you'd ever considered uh, using Lisa as the instrument rather than this. Yeah, I haven't tried Lisa yet. But when I heard about it the first day, I definitely yeah, just check it out. There's a lot in these. Uh... Your exchange with Chicago. Um, uh, I'm going to start off. I have to do a very quick um, little meander into French cultural politics, just so that you know what, where we're coming from. Um, at the moment, the the probably the same things happening in in, in this country, but uh, in France certainly the our education scene is in kind of a turmoil because we're having to adapt to the university system, the European university system. Um, the French university system is saying that because uh, 
there's no research in art, in art schools, then the art schools can't possibly have the same status as universities. Okay? So the French Minister of Culture turned around a few years ago and said, OK, well, of course there's research in art schools, but we'll, if you want proper research, then we'll, <coughs> we'll start funding uh, research groups in art. Okay? Now, this, this might sound very opportunist, but uh, we, myself and Jerome Joir, who are actually the, the coordinating this group, have been waiting for something like this for some time. <laughs> so we kind of leapt on it uh, and wrote this project, which was now uh, probably, we actually wrote it about three years ago, and it took to actually get it through and get it set up. We actually opened up uh, a year ago. Uh, so basically, Locus on is, is a research group. We get funding, independent funding from the French government. We're also, uh, we have a collaboration with the CRS, which is uh, the French research, national research, and the sociology department of uh, University of Provence. Uh, and at the same time, we're linked to the art schools of Aix-en-Provence and La Vida en in Nice. And we are both teachers in, 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 in each of those schools. We, we, have a, we teach part-time, half of our hours in the art schools, and the other half of our time is uh, dedicated to local science. Um, now, why, why are we so interested in, in doing a research group? Uh, both of us... Uh, have been teaching sound in our respective art schools for a number of years now. And we've always been kind of frustrated by the form that the actual degrees and the curriculum takes uh, within the art school, which is really not adapted to the kind of, well, neither the experimentation which we're trying to do or the, the actual forms in the sense of the, the, the the degrees which are handed out and the format that, the format that they take. Okay. Uh, we're very interested in collaborative projects, in network projects, and things which are probably more common in music in the sense that people are used to working as a group, used to collaborating, whereas in art school that kind of thing is kind of difficult in spite of the fact that young artists uh, have been doing that for a long time and want to do it and um, would really like to degrees where they do collaborative degrees and so on and so on. So the way that we set up um, Locus Somnus is as a kind of a lab. Um, uh, there are a small number of students right now. There are five students. Uh, it's on a two-year curriculum. Or, so the first year there were three students. That's Nick Barale, Esther Salman, Salman and Lubin Bello first. Of them are here today. Um, and then there are two more students who just arrived for this session. Uh, so the idea is that we actually <coughs> choose the students. We, I mean, we do have a small kind of entrance exam, but we choose students who are actually specifically interested in the line of research that we're proposing. So we propose these two main themes, one which is audio and space, and the other is networked audio, which are, of course, linked to each other. Um, I mean, there's no kind of real separation between the two. Uh, but there is, there is the kind of idea that we're uh, researching into ways of dealing with the physical um, immediate space um, that we're also looking into remote space, um, the various different uh, modes that that implies. Um, so basically, if students come to us and they're kind of, I don't know what they're interested in is super interesting, but it really doesn't fit into what we're trying to develop, then we're not going to take them on board. We're looking for people who have already developed something within their work, which is going to kind of um, this theme, okay? Um, so, this is the, the two art schools, the two of us, uh, a small group of students. We actually 
uh, another thing which we kind of decided on was that we were not going to try and develop uh, big resources specific to log assignments. So we're very lightweight. Uh, we move around a lot. We go from one art school to the other. One, one month we're in one art school, one month we're in the other, uh, depending on whether a place is disturbed or whatever, you know, or where we're going to do a, well, the facilities we need at a specific point to do a gig. We've also uh, set up partnerships with numerous institution, institutions like Stein, for instance, who agree to um, accommodate our students or us when we need to do something which falls into their specific realm. Um, and so, I mean, we basically, it, the conclusion that we came to was that it's really a lot of effort these days to set up uh, a lot of resources, whereas there are all sorts of people who have these resources and are very willing to cater for your needs if uh, it's at some specific point, if you really know what you want to do. Okay, uh, the other important aspect to the way that we work is the uh, scientific councils. Now the, the scientific council are actually, <coughs> I mean we do have to produce results, okay, for the, the Ministry of the Culture, and we have to publish stuff, and we have a fairly kind of serious, you know, we, they grill us every now and then to make sure that we're doing things properly, and that it, it looks kind of serious, um, or it is serious, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so anyway, we, we have this uh, scientific council who we take very seriously. I mean, it's not like they're not just names on, on, on the paper, or at least the first the first the four names there are, are the ones who are probably the most involved in, in the project. Um, well, Michel can't always come, but uh, the three other ones are present probably three times a year or maybe four times a year and really take part in not only the way that we construct the project but also um, they actually produce quite a lot of stuff, mostly written uh, feedback, the theorists and sort of, uh, critiques and writers. Um, I won't go into everybody's CV here because it takes too much time but you're probably familiar with some of those names. Uh, okay, so I'm, I'm, uh, we're gonna, we are going to talk about the piece which you've probably seen next door, the installation piece uh, which we set up here as kind of a, an example. Um, I'm, I'm not going to really talk about uh, get, get into heavy technical details because I think probably what's more interesting from for us to present in this context is more the method, uh, the, the way that this project develops, the method that that implies, um, and maybe um, a thought process which is a little different to my mind to most of the, of the ways that the developers we met yesterday were presuming that the artists were going to work. Like, right? you know, the artist wants to count the rats, well, we'll make something which counts the rats. <laughs> it's not quite the way we're working, and, and I thought it might be interesting to. Uh, to talk about that development, which I mean, which does also for us involve uh, programmers and developers. Uh, so the way that we uh, organise the the year is that we start out the beginning of the year. We do a big symposium um, where we invite people who are involved, uh, specifically thinking about the question. Well. Obviously, last year was the first year, so we're starting off from scratch. So we invited a fairly wide panel of people who are involved with, in some way, form or another, audio, space, and networking. Uh, the list of the people is here. Once again, I'm not going to go through uh, the list and describe them all. We do uh, make the most of the, the faculty are present uh, in our uh, respective art schools. Uh, so, there are quite a few faculty involved in sound and space and so on. So, um, and so we spent two days, two or three days, uh, brainstorming this question and listening to concerts, performances, and so on. I did want to mention that we have a, a, a fairly um, generous website where all the 
conferences, all the performances which we organize and documented. Uh, this, for instance, Avec a, a little bit of, of French philosopher, Bastien Gallet, who's a Um, it's in French, so I won't let it run for too long. But uh, this is just to say that you can actually go to the website and you can listen to all the artistic, uh, listen to all the conferences, uh, listen to all the uh, performances. There are little videos of the performances, and it's actually becoming quite an interesting resource, I think, if you're specifically interested in these questions. of sophisticated interfaces. This is all done with the microphone on the laptop. Not the actual. I presume everyone is familiar with it. Just on there. Avatar in Canada. where we, we kind of put um, food, food and drink in terms of, uh, of uh, audio space for, for, for a while to come. We organized a, a, a series of lab sessions. Now the first session, with the idea was to try and figure out a way of kind of incorporating everybody's desires and also their expertise into a communal project, which is Uh, obviously not an easy thing to do, and at the same time it's kind of necessary because we're we're not uh, I mean we're not scientists and we're not like you know in some kind of rigorous research mode. And at the same time, we're, we we are interested in trying to figure out what is the common question, and then kind of working together on it from different angles and trying to move that forward and trying to kind of develop some kind of momentum through the fact that there are several of us, okay? So, um, the, basically the three students who are present had, well, uh, Li Guin comes from a, basically a musical background. Um, she was interested in kind of the instrument, the interface, the real time, real space aspect of the, of the thing. Um, Nicola was more interested in kind of sound objects, uh, composition, um, and also spatialization in the kind of the traditional sense of the term spatialization. Um, and Esther was more interested in kind of the conceptual aspect of, uh, of the, the, the sociological, conceptual, spatial uh, aspect of the project. Uh, Esther actually had studied Uh, landscaping at the, um, at the uh, School of Landscaping in Versailles, which is a fairly open-minded school of landscaping. And she ended up doing a thesis about uh, how music relates to the landscape it emerges from, um, using uh, techno and Detroit as an example. Uh, and she was very interested in this idea that maybe we could take sound from one place and bring it to another and see what would happen in that context. So the 
the streaming idea, which um, I'm presuming that everybody's kind of had a look at, but if not, um, that will become clear in a minute. A, a streaming idea developed from this, and we thought, okay, well, what, what, what's actually, maybe we can set up this kind of system which we can then use as, as material for our different experimentations. Uh, and we thought that maybe just from the fact that we're moving around, so we're in between Nice and Aix-en-Provence, or Marseille and Aix-en-Provence, that we could set up a microphone in one place and then start doing stuff with it in another place and just see if something happens. You know? um, so that's, that's basically how it started. We set up a, one microphone, which was the first one was outside the studio complex, which I run in Marseille. Um, and we started working with that stream, uh, just to, to, to some technical details, but we were using pure data to encode OVOLVIS, okay, which is choices, uh, they're both open source. Um, the pure data thing means we can hand it out to people. Also, I've given up using Max MSP because it costs too much, and my students don't want to buy it. So, um, uh, I, I now work with pure data, and I'm probably going to have to make a switch. Just to <laughs> <laughs> uh, and overall, this what we're using because actually, if you start handing out software which you made, which includes MP3, then you should be paying a license every time you, you know, hand out the uh, the software. So um, overall, this is a good choice, and it does actually work better than MP3. Uh, the only problem being is that it took us a while to find a, something to actually decode it directly in the web browser, but we now have found that, so <coughs> that's possible to do. So we set up a, a first microphone and started working with that. Um, now, there were various different responses to this stream. The, um, so we're, we're going to listen to a little bit here. The, 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 probably the first thing we started happening, we did actually start uh, jamming with the stream. So we're doing kind of like seeing what would happen when we were doing kind of live performances uh, with the streams. Uh, and we also were doing other things at the same time. So we started also at this point working with wireless microphones so that we could have different interpretations of the space. We could have uh, remote space with the, with the stream and then we could have a kind of a parameter which was defined with the FM microphone and we could mix the two together and so on. So we were jamming together with these things. Uh, but then often, you know, what happens with the stream is that often nothing actually happens. I mean, you know, you're going you're to jam for half an hour and actually, well, maybe if you're lucky, the dog barks. <laughs> maybe not even, you know. And, and in a sense, it's, it, it's kind of non-performative. You know, it is non-performative. Not like that kind of time space. Um, but anyway, so the, uh, one interesting thing which then started happening was that the Nicola, who's sitting opposite me here, you can raise a hand. <coughs> Nicola started uh, actually listening to these streams on a daily basis. So uh, he was traveling around because he was lives in Paris, and then he was coming to Aix and Nice and so on. And so it's and so finding themselves in different places and every day logging onto the on, logging onto the stream and listening to it for maybe a, a half an hour, an hour, I don't know how long, uh, and then started doing these pieces basically like on a daily basis. So listening to the streams, grabbing sounds off it, and um, um, doing a little mix with it. We can listen to one of the other ones. So this is all the sounds that are coming from the first stream that was set up in Marseille.
Um, so what was kind of interesting was this, this kind of developing this kind of relationship with this remote space, which was this kind of romantic, almost romantic projection of what that place was. Uh, 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 and also another time frame which was being produced, because we started posting these as podcasts on, on the site. So, uh, you know, which have been updated. So it's, it's another kind of form of continuity, which was, we found kind of interesting. Uh, at the same time, there's also a, another version, which is Esther's version, which is kind of very literary, where she writes texts which describe the sounds. And in a similar way, she's actually kind of listening to the streams and then describing them. There's this kind of poetry which is produced uh, from, from the streams. Uh, I'm not going to play you or read you an example of that, it's all in French, or maybe that would be too much at this point. Um, the other thing which was happening at the same time was Lidwin was uh, getting interested in how uh, we could do this within a space. So uh, we started talking about um, long wires, uh, you know, long wires she, coming from a piano playing background. Um, I mean, it's kind of a classical element in sound installation. Uh, and we thought it was kind of maybe an interesting starting point. So we did this workshop uh, in April where we started set up a long wire and we started, we, did, we basically did a performance where we kind of mixed everything up. We were, we were using elements from the streams which had been stored up. Uh, we were um, playing sounds and remixing them live from streams. By this time, we've got two other streams set up. One in uh, one was in Aix-en-Provence, and the other was in Chicago, uh, which is still here. You can hear it on this installation next door. Um, and we did this kind of performance where we were using a, a long wire, where we were feeding the sound from the stream in one end. It was resonating in the wire and <coughs> being picked up at the other end of the wire. This might sound familiar to somebody. Uh, and then. Uh, uh, we were able to modify the acoustics uh, of, the, of the resonance of that sound by touching the wire. And we also developed this little interactive element whereby when you touch the wire, that particular wire kind of, uh, the amplitude increased on that, on that wire. Okay. So uh, uh, a very simple little interface which detected uh, some kind of difference in potential. Um, um, allow us to kind of distinguish the, in, in, within the space. We also started thinking about how the installation was going to look in relation to the stream. So that at this point, we had we set up one stream, one wire for each stream, sorry, and we organized them in such a way as that they were pointing in the direction of the stream, they were, the, the place they were coming from. So you had this kind of reinterpretation of the geographical space which uh, was a little bit approximate. It, it was kind of, you know, depending on the angle and the direction were kind of decided upon uh, in relation to the direction and the distance of the remote source. Um, after this, we organized a second symposium, which we, by, by this time, we had started working with streams, so we, uh, we wanted to uh, invite people who were specifically interested in, uh, in the streaming question. So, um, we invited Adam Hyde, who probably some of you know, he works at the V2 at the moment, uh, uh, has done all sorts of projects with streaming and uh, gave us some very interesting feedback and information. Um, another group uh, called the Orwa, who were uh, doing something with the Pani de Tokyo at that point. Um, Basically, the, the, this, just in terms of method, the, the idea was not, once again, we weren't actually specifically looking at kind of like uh, hugely successful artists to invite, but we were really looking at people who had a specific, and specifically been working on uh, the problematic that we were trying to uh, develop. Uh, the members of our scientific council also came to see this performance installation thing, which was very rough and ready. I mean, it wasn't supposed to be a public uh, thing. And then we had a discussion to, you know, try and figure out 
what way to go, um, uh, what should be the next step. Out of this came really the question of protocol, which um, is probably not something which we talk about quite so much in the, in the musical domain, because uh, you know if a sound is a sound, if it sounds good, it's good kind of thing. Uh, whereas uh, you know in, in the visual arts installation field, then if it's in kind of more conceptual aspect, which kind of takes over at some point or starts off. Um, and so really we, we started getting interested in how the, the relationship between the streams, what, what, where the streams were coming from, uh, what the, the locations of those streams were, um, and how they were going to be uh, represented in, in the local space. Um, so we got back to work again uh, on, a, on a workshop, uh, uh, in a workshop situation in July. Uh, and at that point, we, I mean, we thrown this around in various directions, saying, oh, well, we could set them up, you know, in terms of political circumstances, or we could set them up just in terms of the the acoustic properties of the site that which we're going to send. I mean, there are all sorts of different ways that you can actually choose where you're going to put a microphone. And we finally got to the point where we said, well, A, there are two difficulties. One, we, we, we have different ideas about this. And B, um, you have to go there and set it up. You know, So uh, either we're going to set up like 15 microphones around Marseille and Aix-en-Provence, uh, Nice, which could get a little boring, or at least in terms of the imagination, maybe even if, in terms of sound, it could be probably very interesting. <coughs> um, uh, and also we have to, this decision, we thought that maybe, well actually the social aspect of, of, the, of the project could become part of this decision. So, to come a long story short, we put out a call, an open call to streamers, to other people to stream for us. Uh, and we put out a call on the pure data list and various other audio lists. And we also kind of called up some friends who we thought might be, you know, get the ball rolling. Um, and we actually got a really interesting response from this. Because, of course, the people who read this message and said, oh, this sounds exciting, or wow, yes, I want to take part in this, were, of course, people we were bound to get on with. You know? So we actually established a really interesting network of people uh, through this project, and we now have there are about um, there are about 20 odd microphones which have been set up, which are not all running at the same time because people go away for gigs or they their computers crash or they use their computer for something else or whatever. But most most of the time there are like you know six or seven streams which are running simultaneously and they move around. There's one in Australia, there's one in Dakar, there's one in Oslo, there's one in Iceland, there's all sorts of different places. <coughs> we made this little um, PD patch, which basically is all set up so that it logs onto our, our own server. Um, and so all we have to do is basically write a name and a place in it, uh, and click on the button and it will stream for you. If you want to do some processing, you can. You just, you know, edit the the, uh, the pure data patch, and you add in what you want to the filters or whatever whatever is necessary. Um, and then we got to work on developing the interface. Um, so uh, basically, what we what we felt, I mean, the, the problem with the long wire thing, we really kind of like, because what was interesting with the long wire is that you it, you can actually kind of cross a space with this wire. You can really redefine an exhibition space or the space you're in uh, in a very simple way. You know, it's not like uh, it's not like building something out, but it does actually really uh, yeah define parameters. So. We, at the same time, the actual wire we're using, we weren't getting any kind of, we, we had a problem with the length of the wire, when, when knowing where we were on the wire. That was our big problem. So uh, after going through various uh, 
possibilities, we came up with this solution, which, as I say, you can visit next door and you can try it out, uh, which is, consists of using two resi resistive wires. Uh, resistive wire is the kind of stuff you can buy in model airplane shops for cutting out polystyrene and that kind of thing. Um, um, well, basically, you get from uh, a, a wire which is the length of the wire next door will give you about 100 ohms or something like that. Okay? So, basically, all what, the, what this does is it's like a big slider. Okay? So, the ball which is on the two wires is just shorting out the two wires. Um, so, the resistance of the wires changes as you slide the ball up and down, and you know exactly where you are on the, uh, on the interface. Uh, and this allowed us to build a, a, a patch where you can actually walk through the different locations as you slide the ball along the wire. You go through the different locations on the uh, 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 around the world, which is three. Okay. Um, we well, we came up with um, a few technical things here. Uh, we, we did come up with some problems at this point. One which was we didn't know who was going to stream, <coughs> who stream and when. I mean, this is, you know, it's like everyone says, yeah, sure, we'll stream, and then, you know, the stream's up for five minutes, and then it crashes, or Dakar, you know, the, the, the electricity was cutting out every half an hour anyway. Uh, so we, we actually made this little um, PHP script, which allowed us to go uh, via uh, PD, uh, we can go and check up on the server which streams are up and running, get that information back, feed it into the, the patch, and we can update the patch every or whatever we want every, I mean, every five minutes. So every time that it's it's going wonky because it's it's lost its stream, then it goes and checks on the on the server, finds out what's running on the server, and then starts up again. Um, while we were at it, we we used that same script to make a little web interface um, so that you can now go on the New Juice uh, website and you can check for which streams are running. Uh, is that visible? Yeah. Uh, so when you check on the, the, the map, well, we now have a more sophisticated map which shows you whether it's day or night. But when, if the, the, these little white squares are all the different streams which are, uh, are possibly available, uh, and the ones which are orange and blinking are the ones which you can actually listen to. And when you click on them on, on the map, on the website, you get a little label of all this um, player which comes up and you can listen to the screen live, which I would invite you to do. It's kind of interesting to listen to what's going on in Sweden when you're having breakfast. <coughs> um, after... Um, we, uh, in August, we were invited to do a couple of presentations in, in the United States. Uh, one which was in a festival called Digit, which is this festival organized around the Delaware, Delaware Valley, which is a very beautiful part of the countryside. Um, and this kind of small festival, which is spread out in different places, in you know, local galleries and stuff like that, on the river bank. Um, and at the same time, we were invited to do something in Manhattan, in a small gallery in downtown Manhattan, in Harrison Street. Uh, and so we decided to um, keep working on the idea of our remote uh, relationship. So we kind of split into two groups. Half of us were in, uh, in the Delaware Valley, the other half in Manhattan. We set up basically the same installation in both places. So we had um, we had the, the ball or the wire installation in one gallery in the, in the countryside, and we had uh, the ball on the wire installation in the gallery. Uh, but then we also decided, I'm going to go through this quickly because since the installation is next door, you don't need to listen to it. Uh, we can put a little bit of the gallery in the middle. There's a friend of yours, I think. Hans Christoph, Steiner, yes. Um, and then 
we'd also, as, as I said earlier, we'd started working on this idea of um, the FM microphones uh, picking up kind of the local environment. So we started getting excited about the fact that we were, we were doing a concert on the riverbanks in, in the Delaware Valley. So um, about the, the, the fact that half of us were in Manhattan and the other half in the, in the Delaware Valley. So we went a little further with the um, FM microphone uh, interface and we built Okay, we built a couple of these things, um, which kind of tie in with the stuff which we were talking about yesterday. But so this is the, the wireless parabol parabolic microphone and camera. Um, and basically, the the way it works is this: this takes two people on each end. Okay, but it's uh, the this is a, a little surveillance camera, but which is. It's a Wi-Fi surveillance camera which actually has a, um, a streaming server built right into it. Um, and we just hooked it up so that we, we built batteries into the, the handle of this thing and hooked it up so that uh, it's it, basically if it's in, in the range of one of those Winxy things, it will just stream straight out into the web. Um, this is a standard FM mic. But which we're sending to, um, once again, for the first version, it was actually we're sending it to a, a PD patch. Somebody's remixing the sound. So there's a kind of, uh, this is this kind of duo situation going on where one person is picking up the sounds and the other person is sampling, remixing them. I'm playing it back in a, in a, in a wireless headset, okay? So the person is actually picking up the sounds, but they're getting back what their partner is like remixing. And so there's, it's, it gets kind of interesting. It's an interesting uh, relationship. Uh, and at the same time, I mean, the reason we set up the camera was that if you start doing it, this in a venue, so if we start doing this here, for instance, um, well, when the person goes out of the door to start getting some interesting sounds outside, it's they're gone, right? I mean, you don't really know where they are, what's going on, whatever. And, and we. The, the fact that we have this parallel means that we have a very focused uh, uh, audio field. Yes, it makes the microphone much more directional, as I'm sure everybody knows. Uh, and basically, the, the little webcam image corresponds pretty much to what you're picking up in terms of sound. So if you point it at the floor, you can you, you see your feet, and you, what you're actually picking up is your feet. And if you start pointing at the sky, you'll hear uh, rustling leaves or aeroplanes going uh, overhead, depending on, and it is that directional. And the so the frame, the, the camera, the image is basically the same as the audio field. Um, so the sound being remixed and then is streamed out. So basically, the way that we did this, um, or the way that we're actually developing developing it now, because we want to keep going with this, uh, is that. Um, there was one pair of people on each end, and we were kind of improvising from one side to the other. So uh, it's kind of two duos who are in remote, remote locations playing together, okay? and at the same time projecting the image on the screen of the camera in each space. Um, now we're kind of interested in continuing to develop this, so this is why I, I was very interested in the. Um, uh, the wireless interfaces which were being shown yesterday because one thing which we'd kind of like to do with this is uh, to be able to get it so that the the person actually holding the microphone can also pilot the microphone. Uh, Lidwin is now actually getting into Lisa because it seems like an ideal tool for that kind of activity. Uh, but we'd also like to be able to make it so that it's controllable from the microphone itself. So which is obviously a fairly ambitious and long-term project in terms of it's not the kind of thing you're going to make and then give up on after a couple of weeks because you're bored with it. I mean, you do need to, um, as Michelle suggests, to spend probably some time in actually getting to know how to use it. Um, anyway, so this is maybe a short thing. Let me know if I'm going other time. It's kind of uh, really end there, right? Yeah. yeah. So maybe I'll skip this. Okay. Um, Okay, so this is the uh, 
the last uh, version which we did before we came here, which is a little bit more sophisticated than the version we have here today, because it was um, this was in part of it was in the exhibition space and part of it was in the courtyard. So we strung the wires like 50 meters. They started off this is if you imagine it, if we start off the wires here and then they went out into the street. Uh, and then we spread microphone speakers around and we were spatializing the sound so that we had kind of this new geography of the, of the, of the streams where we could relocate the streams as if they were coming from different areas. I mean, it wasn't literally the cardinal points this time, but it was kind of this new, this reconstruction of, of some kind of geography. So we introduced a, a spatializing aspect. And we also did this uh, visual interface, which uh, you can see next door, but which allows you to know where you are on the stream as you walk along the wire. Uh, it's just a very simple, it's the name of the place uh, where the stream is coming from. Um, we also went back to our experimentations with the acoustic properties of the wire, which were actually quite good on the uh, resistive wire. Um, using the ball to also for its acoustic slider properties. So two people manipulating that, um, the two of us, Nico and myself, mixing the sounds together, also using the, the uh, stream memories as Nico and also. Okay, I'm just, well, some perspectives. Um, yeah, so what, what we're hoping to do next, uh, as, as I mentioned at the beginning, the, we have two year sessions. So the two new students just arrived. Um, basically, there's this kind of layer, layering uh, system whereby we'll be starting off kind of a new project with them but not really a totally new project because we don't want to obviously stop what we're doing and just go on something else and we want to develop something out of that. Um, so we're definitely very interested in this remote audio thing, schizophonia, as Moray Schaefer calls it, the, the world of triple um, Where we've been talking about some kind of sympathy thing about the, the way that sound, you can relate to sound between two different spaces. Anyway, so we just did a symposium about that, which was, uh, once again, you can see on the website and check out all the different um, lectures and text. We're also um, working on a, a publication right now, which we brought out as uh, a DVD and a book. Uh, probably sometime in the summer, um, with our scientific council who are doing most of the work for that, but also the students, and John Joie, who's uh, much better at writing than I am. I'm sure Michel is going to contribute as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, at least somebody's going to come and interview you. Uh, also, uh, just on the streaming project, we're, there, are, there are two things which are happening. Uh, one thing is that we want to um, open it up to more people. So if anybody here is kind of interested in setting up a stream for us, uh, then uh, please mention it and we'll uh, you know, give you the little program and explain what to do. Um, to make that more interesting also, and this, once again, I was very interested, or we were very interested in uh, the some of the boards which were being shown yesterday, <coughs> Uh, because we'd really like to make a little independent box which is wireless, um, has a microphone, an um, OG encoder, and a system in it, and can, you can just put it like in a tree and um, it will stream if you're in a wireless network, which is doable. I mean, I was talking with the people from V2 and they were saying that yes, their board could do this, and, and so we started talking about that. Um, um, and also the other thing which we're kind of interested in is maybe doing something with the people who are streaming. 
because uh, they're all interested in this trade, and they all in different ways. I mean, we uh, uh, somebody came to see us from SARC, the, the research group at the university in, in Belfast. Um, uh, Jason, this is somebody. Rent. 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 The rent. Grant. Yeah. No. The rent. rent. Yeah. <laughs> Jason Cohen. So he, uh, yeah, it's a difficult name. But he, um, so he came and he actually came and did a, a lecture during our symposium about the research they're doing in terms of, of network audio and so on, which is a totally different thing. I mean, it's like you know, online collaboration, uh, sending data and so on. Um, but did a did a improvisation where he was using sounds which had been collecting off the streams. Uh, which uh, so, um, and we know that various people are doing various different things, and we're kind of thinking that maybe it'd be interesting at some point to set up some kind of exhibition or mini festival or something where people would come and uh, show what they're doing. Yes. I have a remark makes it interesting when the character of the sound makes the ball move. Mm -hmm. With the propeller? I don't know if you decided you have analyzed the sound and you have sort of feedback because it sounds quite possible where everybody is steaming and then but when the ball itself moves, mm -hmm. you don't know where it ends. So we call the whole wire as, as the sound changes? Because, yeah, yeah, because um, the character of the sound may be moving right or fast to the left to the right, but then you have to think before what kind of parameters you will use. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Andres ran off Google to tell what he's his mask was in his declaration. I'm Andres Menor. I'm from uh, Moscow. I'm currently at the Federal Center at Moscow State Conservatory. So if you go to the internet's information, you can check the website. And uh, it's a kind of um, part of uh, part of conservatory, but uh, actually it's kind of uh, autonomy. Autonom I mean that uh, since uh, 1992, uh, when we founded this Cable Center, uh, we were somehow independent from our official conservatories uh, administration. And uh, although we are um, under conservatory since uh, officially under 1999, somehow we are developing uh, absolutely independent projects. And so that's a big luck for us. Uh, we have a lot of young people coming, and we teach, and we have a range of uh, lecture courses, and we teach in each uh, Tuesday. So a classical training class, which is like opposite to my class. Uh, each Wednesday, so then uh, some historical instruments like ILS synthesizer each Thursday, and laptop books uh, each Saturday, and so So we have a pretty, pretty condensed, pretty condensed schedule, and uh, nothing is somehow related uh, really to conservatory. Uh, and conservatory somehow also enjoy that because we don't uh, ask about, about any uh, funding or whatever, so it's actually not possible to get from uh, Russian cultural organizations somehow. So, uh, I think that we are more or less independent. Although we have four of us, we have the space, we have uh, all stuff we need to do. And uh, uh, since uh, the Fermi Center is uh, exactly uh, the part of conservatory where Leon Tenny, Russian member of uh, most of you know, the first electronic musical instrument, uh, Fermi Morse, or Fermi, uh, was working in the 60s, and actually he was also uh, making lectures. Uh, not in this space, but in some neighboring space in the um, 20s, before we got you moved to America. And somehow it's uh, like simple for us and most inspiring name and person, because what we're trying to do at Family Center is uh, to develop um, well, different sorts of new musical instruments, interfaces, or somehow ways how to behave, uh, how the performer can interact with his uh, uh, system uh, or visual artist can interact, because we also have a lot of visual artists coming. Uh, and uh, since uh, Termin was working in exactly the same place, somehow it's uh, probably the most obvious to have the name of Termin in the whole center. Uh, because um, we have a huge archive, and we have all documentary of, of, of Termin and developments uh, since uh, actually a little bit 20s and then in the 60s, 70s. And uh, uh, well, I found that most people. Uh, no, Fenimin is a person who invented a uh, musical instrument. Like first we find a musical instrument, uh, it's an embossed, and uh, of course it, it looks like, like that. So we have a uh, box with antennas. Uh, it was invented in 1919, actually, and built in 1920. So now you have uh, two antennas, 
and uh, you don't need to, to touch any uh, object, you don't need to play keyboard or uh, uh, slide or whatever. So you just move in, in a electromagnetic field of those antennas and you control sound. That was the basic idea and it was uh, extremely, extremely useful at that time. And uh, well, it's uh, always uh, useful and even nothing more useful uh, now. Um, that's the first Peregrine uh, 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 have built, and uh, that's him. And uh, uh, exactly at the same time, in Russia, in the uh, early 20s, uh, we had uh, uh, one more uh, person, Nikolai Bernstein, who was developing uh, like parallel uh, ideas and research. If Peregrine uh, has been the instrument which uh, produced the link between your body motion and uh, sound. Uh, the Lego uh, did a huge research on um, uh, human motion. So he was uh, making a um, documentary on all sorts of motion of sportsmen, of musicians, of uh, workers, of soldiers fighting. And, uh, because uh, at that time it was a very popular idea that if uh, you would explore how people uh, move and uh, get rid of uh, some not proper movements and uh, teach uh, like pianists how to play without this, not really these uh, parts of motion, probably uh, music will be much better and tennis will play much faster. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, fortunately, Einstein um, went much further, so he did really um, extraordinary research and uh, he developed the idea of so-called alive motion. And that's, for me, it's kind of link between feminine and uh, uh, human emotion and some kind of concept which is very close uh, to uh, ideas and want somehow to develop an interaction. I don't, need, I don't want to have an instrument which produces your buttons and uh, some very precise uh, controls and you can measure and uh, think and uh, then play. Um, but uh, this idea of uh, alive motion uh, somehow was... Bernstein uh, 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 got this idea uh, making, for example, this research of pianists uh, playing he put these uh, small lamps on joints and it's kind of uh, um, motion capture system very typical for um, most recent uh, uh, computer games or animation but it was made in 1925 actually uh, and uh, mm, uh, he was uh, in this particular uh, research uh, making uh, exploration of how a pianist produce sound because actually uh, when uh, piano sound begins that's a very good question, and uh, um, it was asked for uh, sound engineers and for pianists. And sound engineers said, okay, so sound begins when we have this acoustical vibration that starts. But pianists were completely disagreed because, uh, well, when uh, this acoustical vibration starts, so pianists have no control over the sound. Sound is dead at this point. Well, it, it leaves its, its own line, but pianists cannot control it. So for pianists, sound begins much earlier. And actually, uh, for most uh, pianists at that time doing this research, they found that the idea of pianists, of uh, when sound begins, uh, starts with the uh, like first, first intention, first move, movement of body, when pianists just, the pianists just uh, produce some sort of very strange and some, sometimes very complicated uh, pattern in space that produce sound. And it's not, uh, we cannot really give any rational explanation to that because uh, actually piano mechanics is so easy somehow and uh, you cannot really explain uh, why all those motions produce uh, different sounds. But anyway, so we know that it happens. So uh, according to Bernstein, um, he, he was considering human motion as an extension of body. So he was uh, thinking that uh, body motion is a kind of, uh, not like artificial, but like uh, extra virtual part of your body which uh, is growing with you, and uh, if a uh, musician or any person uh, produces any motion, it doesn't mean that he reacts on some um, stimulus. Like I see apple, I take apple. Uh, each motion, according to Bernstein, is a kind of um, precise. So uh, we have motion before we produce motion. So we have a kind of uh, program which uh, develops uh, as soon as uh, we give, you get this intention to do something, we don't do something. Uh, and um, why I'm talking about that? I uh, just wanted to explain better why um, 
Well, that's part of the Einstein's research. Uh, yeah, we did a lot of uh, really like, thousands of very interesting small researches of different sorts of motion. Uh, Leon Fermin uh, did uh, many several instruments which uh, gave us connection between body and uh, sound. Uh, Fermin groups, of course, antenna, you can play uh, with this antenna and you can uh, produce.
mainly based on the same principle, actually. The principle of failure was in the core of most of his inventions, even a uh, completely different kind of inventions. Uh, that's a poster from the uh, United States. Uh, he founded the so-called teletouch company. Because uh, his idea was to transmit uh, any sort of human uh, senses. Uh, visual, uh, sound, uh, tactile, smells. And uh, well, actually, he was working on it. Uh, not succeeded too much, because uh, finally he did the kind of uh, systems um, to control light. You can't go to the window, light uh, switch on. Uh, he did um, different embodiments of tenons, like uh, also uh, stand for scores of antennas, like we uh, saw yesterday, but in this case with two antennas. Uh, he controlled life with the tenon. In 1922-33, he did a special machine to produce all of light with dependence on uh, body motion. He did this uh, interactive cake, as we call it now. You can call it now. <laughs> when uh, uh, Clara Rockmore, uh, was her birthday, uh, comes to the floors with this cake, become a painting, and can go very well. So you can control the body motion in the uh, cake and the stand. Uh, Fanning did first, uh, I guess, first um, Automatic doors. So we when you come to the door, but that's everywhere now. Actually, it's not, not, not nothing special. But at that time, it was uh, the first experience to make the system uh, working uh, without any touch. You come, it opens. Actually, uh, he was uh, working pretty much with the secret services. Um, uh, definitely, he was earning money not so much from musical instruments, but from uh, uh, when he was working in America. Uh, from, Security systems, like making security system for the antitrust prison, prison, not really good because the training is very unstable. It's important. <laughs> very important somehow to realize that it's very unstable. And it's connected to each particular body. Uh, if you have a big body or small body, uh, you will produce different effects on the uh, instrument. So for prison, it was not the best to make, to make security. But uh, when he was um, he came back to Russia, he was taken into prison, uh, as most Russian scientists in the 30s and 40s, he was uh, in a um, special prison for scientists. Um, <laughs> all that, all the main Latin facts are that scientists were in bad actually. For him it was a opportunity, because um, he could not develop further uh, working outside this prison, because he just know <laughs> to develop or to find any parts or uh, to concept. So uh, at that uh, prison, uh, two years before, Release, uh, he developed uh, probably the most advanced uh, eavesdropping system, so called Buran system. That's a uh, Buran system, so he was eavesdropping from American Embassy, sorry, uh, for many years. I don't really believe that uh, uh, it happens because this system was completely wireless and even without any battery. Uh, just a small metal balloon with a kind of nail, you see, and that's it. It's again a kind of thing. But uh, some kind, kind of extreme thing. Uh, balloon is a kind of resonator. It's a small resonator which resonates on microwave frequency. And uh, nail, it's antenna. And everything is uh, really, really uh, precisely adjusted such a way that, um, ah, and one um, wall of uh, balloon is a membrane, metal membrane. It means that if a uh, sound wave comes, it vibrates and it changes uh, the resonant frequency of this balloon, of this resonator. And you produce uh, microwave radiation on the American Embassy. Uh, and it produces some resonance, resonance in this uh, system. And of course, uh, modulate this uh, beam. And you can detect this modulation from outside. It's like an infinite, infinite machine. So you don't need any power. <laughs> this kind of extreme thing. Um, all those curious stories uh, only about that Fanyin uh, did a lot of inventions, and most of them, you know, many of them, were related to military and security um, uh, area. But somehow he was an artist, he was a musician, he was a cellist, uh, initially a physicist. And uh, as I understand now, because I did a huge, somehow for myself, research of his life, and I have uh, reading all his archives, and I have uh, a lot of uh, pretty unknown papers. I just published actually in 2005 in uh, Austria a big exhibition, exhibition with his unknown uh, developments. And here you can find some 
uh, first, uh, published for the first time in German articles about his uh, inventions, which are not known. Uh, he was developing musical instruments. So that's somehow the problem of uh, artistic life, of the family. He was developing almost uh, devices for art and music, and they were coming mostly to military and security uh, area. Uh, so uh, that's somehow, again, a point uh, from which we started, I started uh, probably to develop uh, the same kind of ideas, because I found a lot of uh, extremely interesting uh, concepts in his uh, research, which uh, could be uh, taken back to music and art. And Fermin Sensor, as I call it, uh, is a kind of uh, probably most uh, easy and beautiful device I, I have uh, related to Fermi. Uh, Fermi looks here, uh, sensor, so the early sensor from the uh, mid 90s, maybe really pretty deep uh, there. Uh, we did a lot of uh, different systems based on um, this Fermi technology. So uh, if you put antennas in front of the performer, the performer can move uh, in front of those antennas and we can detect a uh, piece of emotion. And somehow uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, performance technique could be extended by means of body motion. So that was a initial idea to extend uh, performing technique by means of uh, your body motion. And uh, here uh, the metric alien, which is a patch player, very flexible and very clean uh, person. And, Dance action on stage better than any dance because dancers cannot play, uh, and he can. Uh, and um, that's one of uh, versions of a uh, sensor system based on two antennas. As you can uh, use two antennas, I put them approximately two meter distance uh, from each other, and uh, you can uh, easily program the space, the active space, and uh, detect uh, the character of motion. Because uh, Working with Fermi sensors, uh, I found that uh, it's not really interesting uh, to uh, work with distance. Because uh, if we uh, work only with the, where I am, so now, for example, I have a sample. Uh, it's sample but, uh, let's say. I'm doing exactly the same like uh, all of us did. Uh, previously, I have the sample and I have a granular camera which uh, 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 make the position <laughs> with my camera, everybody. <laughs> but, uh, of course, it's somehow a uh, uh, pretty unusual experience if you don't have any particular sense or any uh, measure, measure in front of you. Just feel this distance and, and play with this uh, very, very precise attentions. Uh, which can be located up to two meters approximately distance. That's not an area this kind of thing. Uh, but uh, much more interesting to have a uh, um, relation to the character of motion. So you move, you move faster or slower. You move in the uh, direction of one thing or back. You uh, produce some sort of uh, repetitions of your motion. It's a kind of secondary parameters. And like uh, Michelle uh, was talking in the first day, somehow it's more pro I think the most important, interesting information we can get from uh, this sort of uh, control. Because uh, we don't uh, really uh, perform, not, not, not stay. He or she moves. And uh, if uh, this uh, control, this extension of his or her body, somehow it's easy to learn. Uh, you cannot really get precise uh, data. Are you disturbed with the magnet? No, not yet. Never. 